Lovely. Thanks so much, James. Please have that in front of you, open in front of you, page 948. You're going to need it open in front of you. We're starting this brand new uh, series in a very old book of the Bible, long before Jesus, and we're thinking, whoa, what's going on? We need God's help, don't we? So let's pray and ask for God's help together. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much. You've got so much to teach us through your Bible. And we pray, Father, you'd help us to hear what you are saying now to us today through your Bible. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, how good are you at saying, the time has not yet come? You're quite good at saying that. Um, Maybe uh, with your preparations for Christmas, you know, oh, there's six weeks to go. Time has not yet come. There's less than six weeks to go, actually. Uh, but don't worry. Uh, how, about that, um, how about that DIY project? Oh, the, the time has not yet come, has it? No. Um, or me with um, thinking about learning to ride bikes earlier. We bought a bike for our children in January. Haven't actually taught them to ride it at all yet. The time has not yet come. I mean, it's cold, isn't it? Life is busy. Haven't quite done it yet. And it's okay. It's okay to put some things off. It's okay. But look at what God's people are putting off in verse 2, page 948. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. It's quite serious. It's so serious that God doesn't even call them my people. He says, these people say... Well, that doesn't sound good, does it? These people. They're not even his people in the way he's describing them. Now, the Lord's house was the temple, the temple in Jerusalem. And once it had looked a bit like this, very, very grand. But in Haggai's day, it looked something like this. It was just in ruins. And it really was shame on the people because, verse 3, Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses while this house remains a ruin? Doesn't sound great, does it? Imagine hearing that from God. Uh, They're putting their own comfort first. Not God's honour, but their own priorities. That's what they care about. And so God says through the prophet Haggai, a prophet is someone who speaks God's message. God says... Put my honour first. Put my honour first. And he calls them to do that. And we're going to see he also disciplines them and he empowers them. He calls them. The God of the Bible, he's gracious. He won't just leave people in rebellion against him like this. He, He calls us back to him. So let's think about what's going on. The temple. Now, the temple was was a building built by King Solomon a long time before Haggai, but it had been destroyed 70 years before Haggai. And the temple was in Jerusalem, which was in the Promised Land. Now, the Promised Land is this big area. The green area is kind of the bit where they actually lived, and you can see Jerusalem is in there. And that's the place where God brought his people with Moses and Joshua. You remember all this kind of Bible history? And the people had everything. They had this beautiful land, but they kept turning away from God. And so God graciously kept warning them, turn back to me, turn back to me. He sent prophets to say, turn back to me. And if you don't turn back to me, you'll be carried out of the land. But they didn't turn back to him. And so in 587 BC, before Jesus, they were carried away by the Babylonians to Babylon. They were exiled far from home. And yet God was still gracious. God said through another prophet, through Jeremiah, he said, you're only going to be here for 70 years, just 70 years, that's all. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Because another empire rose up, the Persian Empire, and they conquered Babylon. And amazingly, the leader of that massive empire, whose name was Cyrus the Great, made a decree that all the Jews could go back to Jerusalem and they could build the temple again. It's amazing how that happened, isn't it? And you know what they did? Well, 40,000 of them did anyway, and they gave up the comfort and security of Babylon 
And they did a very costly thing, a very reckless thing. They moved to Jerusalem. They gave loads of money to rebuild the temple, something like 14 million pounds by today's money they gave to rebuild the temple. And within about two years, they'd got the foundations and they'd got the altar and they were doing their sacrifices again. All seemed brilliant. But then came opposition. You can read about it in the book of Ezra. Um, They were intimidated. It was a dangerous thing to be rebuilding the temple. And so the work stopped. Now, the work didn't stop for a few weeks. The work stopped for 16 years. That's how long it stopped for. The people, were, they were discouraged. They still thought this is important work. It's, you know, it's good to have the temple. It's important, but the time has not yet come. Not yet. It's, it's too hard right now. We'll do it when we've got more security. We'll do it when our harvest is a bit more stable. I mean, we've got the sacrifices, haven't we? We've got the altar, so that's all right. That will do for now. Well, as we've seen, the the true God is gracious. He won't leave people in that situation. He won't leave us out of relationship with him. He calls us back. And through the prophet Haggai, he calls us back and refers to him as refers to himself as the Lord Almighty. Do you notice he keeps saying the Lord Almighty, the Lord Almighty. He is the Lord of heaven's armies, literally. He is the great powerful one. And he says, put my honor first. I'm strong, I'm powerful, put my honor first. Don't worry, put my honor first. He calls us. Now, there's your history lesson. Sorry for the history lesson. We need to know that stuff. But why? Why does it matter to us? I mean, we're, we're thousands of years later. Why does it matter? Well, because many of us have given up previous churches to be part of this new church. We've been a bit reckless. Maybe we've given lots of money to get the work of this church started. And here we are. The foundation, if you like, has been laid Sundays are, are going. It's brilliant. And we could kind of think, oh, yeah, great, we've done that. That's, that's, that's it, isn't it? We've done that, and we know there's more to do. Of course there's more to do, but the time has not yet come. Not yet. Maybe we're in this situation. Now, all this talk of temples and stuff, that seems really remote, doesn't it? It seems like well, that is just, just weird. Like, we don't have temples today, do we? Not for Christians. Ah, well, do we? Let's have a think about it. The temple was the place where God met with his people in the Old Testament. It was a symbol of his presence. And so the people's attitude to the temple was their attitude to God. It's where God made himself available to the people. It is where the sacrifices were done and they'd get animals and the animals would die in place of the people, showing that people could not be punished by God for their sin if they trust in God's way, the animal in their place. That was the idea of the sacrifices. Now, we don't have that stuff, do we? We don't have a temple, do we? Or do we? Let's have a look, shall we? Let's have a look at page 1065. Only page we're going to turn to today. Page 1065. Keep a thumb or something in 948 if you like and turn to page 1065. It's John chapter 2, page 1065 and verse 13. Let's have a look here. Verse from verse 13. Now this is where Jesus is in the temple and he clears out the money changers and the market stalls. And the Jews, in verse 19, they they demand um, uh, some evidence of, of what's going on. Sorry, just before that, they said, what sign can you show us? And in verse 19, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. What's he talking about? Verse 21 but the temple he had spoken of was his body. We do have a temple. Jesus is the temple. That's what he says. Because Jesus is where we meet with God, isn't he? He is God the Son coming to us. 
And Jesus actually fulfills all that the temple was. Jesus fulfills the sacrifices too, because he is the lamb who died in our place on the cross. And he died there so we don't have to face eternal death. He took it for us. Jesus is our temple. And so our attitude to Jesus is our attitude to God. Now, Jesus is not on earth now, like the temple was on earth. Jesus rose again, and Jesus ascended to heaven. Jesus is in heaven, but Jesus poured out the Holy Spirit, didn't he, on his people, so that now he is on earth. He's dwelling in his people. We are the temple. That's what the Bible says. We are his body, the Bible also says. We called that in the New Testament. Uh, in the language of Peter, he writes this, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, a temple, the house where Jesus dwells. If you're trusting in Jesus, you're it. You're the temple. We're the temple. We're his body. Oh, that's quite complicated, isn't it? But it's pretty amazing stuff. If you don't follow all of it, don't worry. But here's the point. How do we put God's honor first? That's what he says in Haggai, put my honor first. How do we do it? By putting the building of the temple first. The building of not the physical temple, but the spiritual one. In other words, Jesus' body his house, the people trusting in Jesus, building that body. That's what we're to put first. That's why Jesus said, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, because that's what brings God honor now. God is honored as more and more people come to trust in Jesus, as they trust him and as they're forgiven, as they get to know God, as they're saved, as they become part of his body. That's why we say we are a church for people who don't do church because that brings God glory as people come in to his body that's what we long to do in Cowley that's how God is honored today now maybe in your earlier Christian life this was a really big thing for you maybe it was maybe um, maybe you had that thrill at the good news of Jesus and you longed for others to hear it and to come in maybe it made you really sacrificial with your time, with your money, and you started giving recklessly. Maybe you were a bit reckless in how you spoke to your friends about your faith and your colleagues about your faith. But then, just like the people in Haggai's day, maybe life started to settle down a bit. And work is busy, and relationships are busy, and children, they're busy. And it all takes over. And we still think it's important. We do think it's important, but the time has not yet come. Maybe, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll be doing that stuff again when we've got more capacity. You know, when our careers are more settled down, when our, when our family is a bit more settled, then we'll get on with it. Maybe you find that in your personal life. Maybe we'll start to find that in our church life too. As Grace Church, you know, we started with this thrill and this excitement of starting a new church and we were sacrificial with our time and with our money. But as time goes on, well, life is hard and things are busy and it's not as if it's easy, you know, witnessing to Jesus. It's not as if there's no opposition. There is opposition. It is hard. And we can end up thinking, well, why struggle? Why struggle on? Maybe the time has not yet come, we think. Well, God is too gracious to leave us like that. God calls us back and he says, put my honor first. He calls us back and maybe he might discipline us back too. Let's have a look, page 948. We're back on page 948, how he disciplines the people then. Page 948, verse, 11, uh, verse 9 to 11. Page 948. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, 
because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought. This was God's discipline on the people. These people, they're under a thing called the Old Covenant, which is the covenant with Moses. And if they were obedient to God, things would go well. And if they were not obedient, things would not go well. And there were these things called the covenant curses. And one of them was this idea of drought and poor harvest. And it meant that they're pouring all their heart and their work into the harvest, and it's just not delivering. But it wasn't just a punishment. It wasn't just God being vindictive, it was actually God's graciousness to them, to say to them, come back. It was discipline to help them realize what they're doing wrong. That's how it was supposed to work. And so what about us? Is God going to kind of stop our harvest or something? Well, no, he's not. This is brilliant. Because if you're trusting in Jesus, we do not face the covenant curses. Do you know why? Because Jesus did. This is brilliant. Galatians 3. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who's hung on a pole. Jesus was hung on a pole. He received all the curses of the old covenant, so we don't have to. That means if you're trusting in Jesus, you will never, ever, ever be punished by God. Isn't that great? Even if you fail him, you'll never be punished because Jesus was in your place. It's great news, but the pattern still stands. God may use the circumstances of your life not to punish you, but to discipline you. And God keeps saying in Haggai, give careful thought to your ways. So let's give careful thought to our ways. Ah, that's interesting, isn't it? Never mind, we'll do it without the pictures. We can, we can handle that, don't worry. Let's give careful thought to our ways. Look at verse 6 with me. Have a look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. God says, You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Does life ever feel like that to you? You find yourself pouring yourself into work and into sorting out your home and your children, and yet you feel you're never quite making it. It's never quite delivering, and you're never quite fulfilled. Now, those things, they're not bad things, but they shouldn't be getting in the way of us honoring God. And they may be. If you're not trusting in Jesus, God has set the world up in such a way that you'll never ever find fulfillment in those things. They will never ever deliver. They'll always be hollow. They'll always leave you wanting more. And that's because you are looking in the wrong place for fulfillment. And God wants you to know him through Jesus, because that's true fulfillment. That's if you're not trusting in Jesus. If you are trusting in Jesus, though, God may still use this sense of unfulfillment to discipline us, to show us that our priorities are becoming (coughs) misplaced, not as a punishment, but as a little nudge, a gentle nudge. And God says, give careful thought to your ways, Are you satisfied and joyful in your life? Are you satisfied and joyful as part of Grace Church? If you're not, there could be many reasons for that. And it might just be our temperament that means we're feeling like that. But maybe, maybe, God might be showing us it's our priorities that are wrong and they need reordering. Now, probably all of us feel slightly convicted by that idea. Of course we do. We are such a mess. We are such a mixture of motives. All of us are. How can we ever have the right priorities? 
Well, I want to end by telling you how gracious God really is. He's so gracious. He calls us, he disciplines us, but he also empowers us. This is brilliant. Have a look at verse 12. Verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josadak, and the high priest, the, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. The people, they realize, they realize God speaking through Haggai and, and they obey him and they come back to him. And they're repenting and they're humbled. They are fearing the Lord. Now, fearing the Lord just simply means remembering who he is and revering him for who he is. They're just literally coming before God, realizing who he is, the Lord Almighty, who deserves their honor and their time and their money. They come to God like that. And then look how gracious God is. Verse 13, then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people I am with you, declares the Lord. I am with you. He says that when they haven't started building a temple. Do you see that? They haven't changed their behavior. They've not started building a temple. But he says, I am with you. It's not a reward. It's not that they built the temple. Then he says, I'm with you now. You built the temple for me. It's not a reward. They just literally came back humbly. What makes them start to build the temple? Verse 14, have a look what makes them start to build the temple. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God. God does it. God stirs up their spirit. God empowers them. And then they start building the temple. This is remarkable. The God of the Bible, the true God, is not a God that we serve out of guilt and trembling lest he might be angry with us and punish us. That is not the God of the Bible. We don't just grit our teeth and be the best we can and hope it's going to be good enough and are secretly terrified that it might not be. That is not the Christian life. God does it. God stirs up our hearts because his Holy Spirit is at work in believers. He is with us. You know, when Jesus said those words, go and make disciples of all nations, what did he say next? I am with you always to the very end of the age. We don't do it. He does it through us. I find this so encouraging. When I feel a failure at working to build Jesus' body of believers, which I do quite often, I'm sure you do too. When I realize my priorities are wrong, when I feel nervous about starting a conversation with my Muslim friends, with my Muslim neighbors, with my secular Polish neighbors, if I'm coming humbly to God through Jesus, God is with me. He will empower me. He will stir up my spirit to do this, not me. A few of us, quite a few of us actually, are doing this course called uh, Friendship First, which is a course about reaching Muslims and relating to Muslims on a Monday night. And on Monday, a couple of us were chatting to this guy who, who's done lots of Muslim outreach. And he said to us, Whenever he's tried to talk to people about Jesus out of guilt and because he really feels, I've got to try hard for God, whenever he's done it for those reasons, he's always failed. That's what he said to me. Always. But he also said to us recently, he's been rediscovering God's grace and he's just been praying to God for God to work through him. And God has been. There's a saying that when we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. And I think that's what's going on here. If you are struggling to have God's priorities, if you feel like life is taking over, if you know the feeling of despair, because it's just hard having his priorities all the time, 
The answer is not to sort your life out. The answer is not to buck up your ideas. It is in some religions, but it won't bring lasting change. The answer of the Bible, of God's grace, is to ask God to change your heart, to stir up your spirit, because he's a God of grace. God says, put my honor first. And he calls us to do that. And he might discipline us to do that. But wonderfully, he also empowers us to do that. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God of grace. Thank you, Father, that you are with us if we're trusting in Jesus. Father, if we are having wrong priorities in our lives and starting to say the time has not yet come, please, Father, would you help us to put your honour first. Thank you that you call us back. Thank you you might even discipline us back. But, Father, please, would you empower us Would you stir up our spirit? Would you stir our hearts to put you first? And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.